I am talking today because I have sort of a dual life on campus, though most of you know that. I work here at MISTI, um, and then I spend the other half of my time um, working with a group of people um, called Sun Buckets, which is a research group on campus, but we also have a business startup. Um, and so I'm mostly just going to tell you about what it is that I do when I'm not here. So for context, um, I think it's important to know what the global cooking problem is because it's sort of the reason I do anything outside of MISTI these days. So globally, 3.1 billion people still burn solid fuel inside their home, which is wood, charcoal, animal waste, some sort of some bio waste from like corn husks and things like that. Um, this results in indoor air pollution conditions that cause 4 million premature deaths every year. It's the leading cause of death in kids under the age of five in the developing world, and it's responsible for more than 20% of global climate forcing. It's also, I like to say, one of the biggest problems that nobody in the Western world has ever heard of. Because things that lead to climate change. Okay. Mm -hmm. So from these individual cooking fires, um, there's a lot of black carbon particulate matter um, that goes up and a lot of carbon dioxide. And it accounts for 20% of those in, in the atmosphere. It's not burning in any ways. Um, you clear your waste that all that shit is Right, it's done very inefficiently. Open flames inside houses, usually without chimneys or windows or any sort of ventilation. So the team that I work with um, developed this cook stove um, and we'll talk about how it works in a minute, but it stores solar energy um, so that you can take it inside and cook with it in your home without lighting a fire. You can cook with it outside. Um, you can put a lid on it and store the heat and then say you want to cook at night, you can charge it during the day, take it inside. At dinner time, you just take off the lid and you cook like you always would. Um, the benefit of this um, is that you can cook the way you've always wanted to cook. So. In the last 10 to 20 years, there's been a lot of um, work around improving and making cooking more clean, as Rebecca said a few minutes ago, around the world. So there's this Global Alliance for Clean Cookstoves, which um, Hillary Clinton helped start when she was Secretary of State. Um, and they're committed to making cooking clean, cleaner. Now, this usually takes the form of improved combustion, which we'll talk about in a few minutes. Um, but the reason people like to cook over fire is because it's the way they're families and have been doing it for generations. It's easy, it's hot, they can cook in a variety of different manners. Whereas if you cook with um, just a straight up solar technology like in a box or a panel or on a parabolic, you kind of have one cooking choice available to you for each of those different technologies. So this sort of combines the best of both worlds. You can be inside, outside, at high temperatures, night or day with solar energy. So the way that it works is this top picture on the left is sort of what it looks like if you were going to cook with it at home. It's got handles, you can move it around, um, and it's just a series of layers. So if we look at the sort of like the, the blowout version on the side here, um, this top part with the black circle, that's the part where you put your pot. So that's like, imagine it's an electric range, that's where you put your pot, and it's connected to, um, it, it has these fins, if you will, a circular piece that comes down that fits inside of a container that's full of a phase change material or a thermal storage material. So it's a small amount, it's only about five kilograms, but it can store several megajoules of energy, which is quite a bit for a small volume. That's all then heavily insulated, the pink represents insulation, and then these are just prototypes still, um, so it's all sort of secured and bolted together in cake pans. So it's not very handy. Um, but here's how it works. So you do need a parabolic dish, and these are pretty common throughout the developing world. There's been lots of um, there's been lots of efforts to get people to cook directly over these, and you can you can hang a pot there, and you could boil water or heat something really hot. But what we do with it is we take our our sun bucket, and we flip it upside down so that the cooking surface is pointing right at the uh, the focal point of the dish. You leave it out in the sun for about an hour, and it's fully charged. So a phase change has happened. So the solid thermal storage material has melted and it's basically, I always tell, like when I go to schools and tell kids about it, I always tell them it's lava salt. So it's, it's just lava and you take it off and it's all sloshy. You put a lid on it right away and then you can just cook on it like you always do. So this is actually my backyard. I cook with one at home. Um, in this particular pan, it's just potatoes. 
Um, but you can put a lid on it and store the energy for up to six hours. And when we say six hours, we really mean that you can still cook dinner six hours later. Mm. If you put a lid on it overnight in the morning for breakfast, you could still boil a liter of water, which is enough for coffee or tea or oatmeal wow. or something like that. Um, one of the opportunities that we have left that the engineers on our team, which is Joe's and my friend Matt, um, is to look at um, double wall insulation. So the insulation in this is a little on the heavy side. And since around the world is primarily women who are the cooks, um, we don't want it to be burdensome. So this thing weighs about 22 pounds right now, but half of that is just insulation. So if we can improve the insulation technology, not only would it cut weight, but we could store the energy longer so that in the morning you could cook a full meal, perhaps, and not just oatmeal or tea. So that's sort of the, that's sort of the goal. That's where we would like to be. All right, and then you just cook as usual. So <clears throat> here's a picture, it's kind of, it's kind of dark. Uh, my colleague Matt took this when he was visiting India a couple of years ago. Um, it's a woman with an improved cook stove. Um, yeah, sorry, it is kind of dark with the lights on here. But that's just sort of like a, it looks like sort of like a vase, a ceramic vase that you put wood into at the bottom and you light it on fire. But, oh, thanks, Rebecca. So you can see she's feeding sticks into it. Um, and you can kind of tell the picture is hazy and it's not because it's out of focus, it's just because it's really smoky in her kitchen. So she and her children breathe that in all day long. So that's the most common type of solution that, um, that most people are working on when they're trying to make cooking clean around the globe are um, improved cook stoves. So we say that solid fuel is just so you're burning it in your kitchen, um, you've just lit something on fire in your kitchen. An improved cook stove is something that is improving the combustion. So usually that means that it's intaking a lot more air so that you're combusting the fuel more completely, it's more efficient, and then there's less emissions that way. Um, for the wealthiest people, there are LPG and gas cook stoves throughout the world, um, but this is usually reserved, like in, in Haiti, this would be reserved for like the wealthiest 9 to 10% of people can afford that. It's a little bit more common in the cities. Um, in Africa, large urban centers, and in India, but most of the cooking um, is done by rural folks like this, and they don't have access to gas. So unsurprisingly, I think, is that the cleaner the stove, so in this case LPG, if you ignore sun buckets, of those three, LPG or gas cook stoves are the cleanest, they're also the most expensive. So the people who need it the most can't afford it. So the the goal of our company and our research team is to make something that is completely carbon neutral and clean, um, to make sure that there's no negative health benefits, so that it's, it's good for you to have in your home, and so that it's affordable. And so the goal right now is looking at a bunch of different business options for selling these to the um, folks in the developing world, um, by which if they're buying firewood, this wouldn't be more expensive than firewood, it would maybe be cheaper than firewood. We are not necessarily competing with the people who are still able to collect free fuel. Um, so there will be some people who will still collect firewood and animal waste. Um, those are not our initial customers. So our initial, initial people we're trying to reach are the people who are spending 25% like of their annual income on fuel for cooking. Now, other types of solar technologies that we talked about or that I mentioned a minute ago usually take these forms. So there's that parabolic dish, which looks just like the thing that we use to charge our sun bucket. Um, and this works great. You put a pot there and it reaches really high temperature. So you can, boil, um, you can boil things. If you had a pan with a little oil in it, you could fry something in it. Um, but it only reaches really high temperatures. So if you wanted to do something slow, you want to slow cook all day long, that's does not going to be very helpful. Does this work on a rainy day? I mean, how much sunlight do you need? You need there to be sun when you're using it. So during monsoon season, you're not going to use it very often. If you have an hour break in the clouds, so like it's like you know, when I lived in Florida, it was cloudy every morning, and then in the afternoon there were thunderstorms, but there's always a break in the in the daylight, so you could or break in the clouds, so you could use it then. Um, so in places where there is a lot of cloud cover or rainy season, you'll still, they would still need a backup fuel source during that time. But in many places of the world, um, most of the energy impoverished live right along the equator where it is very sunny most times of the year. The Asian market gets a little bit tricky when you're looking down at like Southeast Asia just because of the humidity and the clouds there. The other one on the right is a panel or a, or a box cooker, um, and these are also, these also work really well. Um, but you can only kind of bake or slow cook 
in it. So if you wanted to put a loaf of bread in there or some muffins in a couple of hours in the sun, they'll be baked. Um, if you wanted to make a meal in a hurry, this is not something that you're going to be able to do. Little so, piece of history. Mm -hmm. The box solar was from Bill Peterson at U of I Egg Engineering in 1977. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they've been around a long time. Right here on campus is where it came from. Yep. You see these all over, um, all over the world, and they're not they're not readily adoptable because it changes the way most people cook. So most of us don't only bake or don't only slow cook. And so if that's your primary method of cooking, then this is a great thing to have because then you're not changing your behavior. But if you have to radically change your behavior, you're probably not going to use these on a consistent basis. And in fact, there's quite a bit of literature that says the reason solar technologies for cooking are so um, easily abandoned is because of the behavior change is too great. So when we compare what we have, which is another solar technology, to these other existing ones, it just sort of combines the best of both of those. So you can do high heat or low heat with the cooking temperature. Most people want high heat. They want to be able to boil water quickly. They want to be able to fry foods or um, brown meat or something along those lines. Um, but we can cook at low temperatures. You can take this indoors and cook, which with, like, with the other ones you can only do when the sun's shining, but I could cook it or I could have charged my sun bucket yesterday when it was sunny and then use it today when it's cloudy. Um, and then I can bring it inside my house and cook at night too. And part of the reason for that is that in many parts of the world people want to cook indoors. Um, and if in a lot of cases in the, or a lot of places in the world, um, the ability to cook at night is absolutely crucial because a lot of times men come home after dark. And if there isn't a meal for the men when they get home, gender-based violence spikes. Um, and so having a clean way to cook at night um, is something that's important in terms of flexibility and how it fits into culture, but also in reducing gender-based violence. So if you give a woman a, you know, a solar cooker and told it that's the only thing she can use, that food's not gonna be hot when the head of the household, which is the male, comes home and that, that can result in negative impacts. Mm -hmm. How do you cook with low heat in something? I'll show you. Okay. So there are other, a few um, other players in the stored solar um, arena. There's a company called GoSun. This is their initial prototype, and this is just someone who bought one's um, picture, so it's Creative Commons, I can use it. Um, and it's, it, th these work really well. Um, they use a different type of storage um, material than we do. In fact, they're always asking us what we're using because they just buy off the shelf and they've had some problems with theirs um, breaking down, exploding at trade shows and things like that. Um, what was that one? Exploding in what? Someone that we talked to trade at a trade show saw one of theirs explode. And by explode, I think what she means is that um, this tube is glass, and then there's, I think it's just a hot wax inside, and it's very fragile, and the glass can't withstand high enough temperatures. Now, I actually really like Go Sun. I think that they're onto something. They're looking at campers and hikers as their primary market, um, and I think that that is fine for that purpose. I think that if you gave someone in the developing world who's used to cooking in a big pot for 10 people and said, cook in a tube, that she'd laugh, is what I think. Um, and so they're, I don't think they're even considering going after the developing world, but they are trying to improve their storage. Um, and they're always kind of interested in how we've done it. So, so this bakes, basically? It, it does reach high temperature, so you can kind of like simmer in there. Um, but it's inside, you can't But it's in the tube, yeah. I mean, I think you can pull the tube out and kind of move things around, um, but that's about it. So this is a video of um, a culinary student at Navajo Technical University making a traditional Cuban dish. Matt on our project is, um, his father's from Cuba. This is called picadillo. Um, I didn't eat it because I don't eat um, red meat, but there's a whole lot of stuff going on in this dish. But you can see that there's steam coming off of it that's hot. The meat's been browned. Um, there's olives and peppers and onions and raisins in there. Um, and I think they pour broth in at some point, but I'm not sure if I have it in here. But the steam is the part that I really like. So on my slide a few minutes ago about solar technologies, I said you can cook indoors or outdoors. So um, I sort of internally for our own team started a blog. I cook at home and I started a blog just to take pictures that would maybe show that, yeah, it works. Here's how it works. Here's how much food I cooked. Here's the caloric content of that meal. Um, 
because communicating, there needs to be some sort of metric that you can communicate to the end user. Just to say it's hot, so what, so it's fire. There needs to be something that proves to them that you can, um, that you can actually replace fire for them. So we, we started making this blog, or I started making this blog. So this is out of my deck. I'm cooking outside. And I made some sort of like noodle pad thai dish with, with chicken and all sorts of vegetables and stuff in there. And then when that was done, I was still made some sort of shrimp dish. So this is all on one charge. Um, and it fed my family of four plus leftovers. So one charge. So it took an hour to heat it up. And then I was able to cook for about an hour, hour and a half to make all that. And then to just sort of juxtapose that, here is my ugly kitchen. Um, getting ready, it's so ugly, and it's dark, so the pictures get a little blurry inside, but um, you can see the steam coming off and boiling water, getting ready to boil the corn. Um, I'm grilling indoors, I have a grill pan, so anything that you can do on a grill or on your stove, you can do on a sun bucket. Now, Rebecca asked a really good question a minute ago, and she said, well, how can you cook with low heat on a sun bucket? Well, the easiest answer to that is to think about ice. So basically, what we have inside of here is, um, something that can melt and then return to a solid, and then melt and then return to a solid. And when it's really, really hot and it's completely molten, that's when you have your most high heat. So that's when you would do the high heat intensity tasks, like boil or searing. Um, as you cook, the temperature starts to drop as the solid or as the, the liquid phase moves back into the solid. And so that's when you would start cooking at your low temperature. So if you want to simmer for a while, um, you can do that. I've used this as a slow cooker where I've seared a bunch of chicken and then I threw it in a huge ceramic dish with a lid and left it there for four hours and then I had pulled chicken when we were done. So anything you can do on a stove, a slow cooker or a grill, you can do on this. Um, so here you can see I'm toasting the buns for the burgers that I made. And so the point of all of the, the cooking is that um, sort of our foundational principle is to engineer something that maintains traditional cooking cultures around the world. So if you come in, I mean, I think there's all sorts of case studies where, you know, you know, these white Americans with like the best intentions go into these little rural villages in Africa and say, oh, here come the white people, here to solve our problems. And then it's like, and then do it our way. It works really well. I mean, great intentions. That's not, that's not useful or what they want. What people want is to cook like they've always cooked, cook like their mom cooked and their grandmother cooked. And so our foundational principle to the way that this is designed is to listen to what people want. So we actually have a bunch of these units deployed in um, off-grid families around the world. Listen to what they want, um, take their feedback and make it better, and make sure that they could cook on it the way that they want to cook on it. So that means using their existing utensils, and that includes pots and pans. And in some places of the world, they use really strange looking pots and pans. Some of them are concave, some of them are convex. That's a challenge, we're, we're working on addressing it. You wanna be able to make all your family recipes, all the things that you normally do. If you, you know, can't go to India and tell them to make tacos, that's not gonna work. So they wanna cook like they've always cooked at temperatures that mimic fire. And that means around the world, sauteing, grilling, frying, simmering, toasting, slow cook. So we can do all of those things. Um, you can see that I'm making spaghetti sauce in this particular picture. Um, and then, you know, family sizes change, and in some parts of the world it's very cultural in which the families are quite large and one person might be cooking for up to 10 people. So you need to be able to cook on one of these for quite some time to prepare enough food. So on one of these, I mean, I use this at home once or twice a week, um, and it makes more than enough food for my family, which is my husband and I and our two kids. Um, average mass of the meals have been one and a half um, kilograms. I do weigh all the food. Um, the raw ingredients put together um, ranges between 900 and 2,900 calories so far. 900 is when I made like a huge pot of tomato soup. Who knew there's like no calories in that at all? Um, the 2,900 calories is when Rob made French crepes filled with like Nutella. <laughs> Um, the Nutella is not even included in there. It's just all that melted butter. Yeah. Um, but we do all sorts of things with it. Now, there is a behavior change associated with using the sun bucket. Um, charging is one, and we'll talk about that in a second. But you do have to use your high heat tasks first. Um, I learned to cook in the like 2005 era by watching the Food Network when the Food Network was like a really big deal. And they always tell you to get your pot of water boiling first anyway. So that's how I cook as it is. So I haven't had to change, but I imagine that some people um, would have to get used to doing the things that require high heat first. 
and then simmering after that low heat stuff. So there, there will be some behavior change and that's my role in the research team is to look at what those behavior changes are, how we can communicate about it, what types of education needs to be done for it, um, and that's complicated. What's the diameter of the, the cooking surface then? Um, it is nine inches, I think, 10, it's less than a foot. And uh, what is the diameter? A little less than a foot. Uh, it's about this big. I think. I think it's. I think it's nine, nine or ten. And do you have a price point that you're looking for? <clears throat> We're just starting to work with manufacturers right now, so we don't want to sell it. So you have to have the dish to charge, right. but that can be communal because you don't need it for very long. So if you live in a close knit community, we envision that that being communal, or maybe a small business in which people. Um, sort of a subscription model, um, which is a common way to get your water, propane, and firewood in India, for instance. You would pay someone a flat monthly fee, and they would deli they deliver your water every day or once a week or whatever. So we envision deliver delivering these, and so that's someone's job is to charge them. Um, to an individual customer to sell them, I mean, the most expensive improved cook stoves throughout the developing world rarely exceed 50 US dollars. Um, the most highly adopted ones are in the range of $1 to $5, but those break really quickly, and then they have to be replaced, or they're not, and they just go back to fire. So that's something that needs to be investigated, um, and that will ultimately be determined kind of by two things, I think. Um, whatever we can manufacture them for, and we're talking to several to drive the price down as far as possible. And of course, if there's a big enough market, we can make enough of them that it goes down even more. The other option, um, we were just at a business competition two and a half weeks ago, and there was a lot of interest in having a North American and European market, um, which, you know, we all feel really strongly and passionately about solving this global cooking problem because it's, an, it's a humanitarian issue, it's an environmental issue. I find it to be a women and children's issue, and that's what sort of got me involved. Um, we all feel really strongly about that, you know, and I'm, I'm less interested in the hikers and the backpackers. But if there is interest to sell to hikers and backpackers, the National Park Service, maybe FEMA, that would produce income that could drive the cost lower, making it easier, have a larger impact. And so um, I'm actually kind of excited about that right now. Um, and I'm hoping that could be something that we work towards. So that was a long answer to saying we don't actually have a real price point just yet, but we hope to keep it as low as possible. So are you investigating like buy one, get one initiatives? And <coughs> We are. Um, it's funny that you say that. Someone asked that um, during our, um, our talk at our competition. And uh, one of my colleagues was answering all of the, sort of like the business financial questions. And she was like, we are very much against just giving these away. Because research shows that if you just give these away, nobody uses it, which is absolutely true. It's a little different than like the Toms, buy one, one for all, right? I'm not wearing my Toms today, but usually I am. Um, that's different, because you need shoes, and it's not a behavior change. You want to put them on. This requires a behavior change, and it's been shown that if you, char if you give a cook stove away for free, no matter what kind it is, there's really low adoption rates. But if you charge even a dollar for it, people have decided that they want it, and they've made it become a priority, and they've paid even if it's only a dollar. So yes, that is exactly what we're thinking, except for that it would maybe be Buy one, give one for $5. Yeah, and, and people, people in the United States love that, right? That's why people spend 50 bucks on a pair of canvas shoes that wear out in six months because you know that Blake, whatever his name is, is giving some kid in Africa a pair of shoes. It makes us feel good, right? That's why we're doing it. Um, so we can still say, you know, buy one here and like let someone in the developing world have one for cheap. Um, and so that would be a sort of the North American <clears throat> developed world model. So I started this blog, um, which is actually really fun, because I think that I always sort of harbored some secret dream to have a food blog, which is actually really hard, and I'm not very good at it. But it's kind of fun. Um, and it was just a way to, um, to sort of look at ways, different ways of communicating the information internally. There are quite a bit of followers. Um, who knew? Um, and you know, there's weirdos that post comments and stuff that I usually take down. But um, but that was all just to... And it's called Cooking with Sun, sun Buckets? Yep, dot com. Dot com. Mm -hmm. Okay. Mm -hmm. I hope to have a new blog post this weekend if I get around to it. 
So what are we doing? So that was sort of, that was all kind of a little bit on the businessy side. What I really meant to talk about um, or focus on was sort of the research side. And so I thought I would tell you a little bit about where these are and what we've learned from it and then sort of future next steps. So um, I really love the Southwest of the United States. I think Arizona and New Mexico are beautiful. This is on someone's property on the Navajo reservation just north of Winslow, Arizona. I just think it's pretty, so that's why that's there. Um, we got involved with the Navajo Reservation um, in two different places, in Crown Point, New Mexico, and then in Winslow, Arizona, because we came across a group of people from Navajo Technical University, culinary art students, and a professional baker who teaches the baking courses there, made a solar oven. So most of the Navajo Reservation, which is you know, the four corners of the United States, it's bigger than many of the states in the United States, and most of the people that live on it are off-grid. Um, it turns out that every pole on the grid, Jana, you can correct me if I'm wrong, it's like 10 grand per pole to get it to come out to your property. So it's sort of cost prohibitive to tie to the grid when you live in sort of a very rural location. So this group from Navajo Technical University got this small student funded um, EPA grant a couple of years ago. And these are all um, materials that they just sort of found in the trash. And so it's sort of a plexiglass with this, this aluminum foil inside. Um, and wood boxes that sort of just nailed together, it collapses, um, and they want some money to produce these, and they were kind of showing other people on the res how to, how to make them. And then it kind of stopped because they were culinary art students, and they graduated, and people get busy, but we found them, and we thought that was really interested, and we were wondering if there was any like room for collaboration, so we started talking last winter every like Tuesday morning to this Chef Joe, who um, is actually a patchy, um, but he works at Navajo Tech in the Culinary Arts Department. And then they invited us out over spring break last year to bring out what we had and just sort of like hang out. And so we ended up hanging out in the industrial kitchen in the Culinary Arts Department for a week, um, which was really fun. Um, I mentioned that I had like secret dreams to like be a chef, right? Um, so that was really fun. This summer we were in Winslow with six off-grid families. Most of them were sort of subsistence um, they do what they can on their own property with goats and sheep, sometimes cattle. Um, they grow whatever they can, but honestly, it's so dry that not a lot grows there. Um, propane is very expensive. You can see that there's a large propane tank on the side of the house. This is one of the houses of um, one of the families. Um, and that, like I sort of extrapolated, like I have a propane tank for my gas grill, and I know that's about 20 bucks. Um, whatever that is, I forget how many times bigger than it was, was about four times the price of what it would be here. Um, so propane is very expensive because there's demand for it on the reservation. So all of the border towns like Winslow and, uh, and Dundee or something um, have exorbitant costs on propane. Firewood on the res, so the Navajo, um, the main Navajo council, and granted this reservation is huge, they distribute firewood um, through the, the charter houses throughout the year, but it turns out that it's really political. And some of the families we were working with didn't actually get their firewood last year. Um, and so they were kind of, they were really excited about this. The younger people I was surprised about, um, the woman in the, and then her brother is the guy without the hat. Um, they're both in their 30s and they were really, really excited about this, um, which kind of surprised me. I mean, I'm, I'm not sure, I didn't really have any expectations, but they were very excited. Their aunt, whose house this is, and she lives with a couple other women, um, was open to it, but not like, I wouldn't say she's excited. Um, so we're really curious to get back out there and see what they've done. They have um, data loggers that were recording the temperature so we could see what kinds of things were being done with them. Um, the difficulty is that most of their phones only work on the reservation and getting a hold of them is very hard. Um, and so we should have been out there sometime this month because their data loggers are not collecting data anymore, um, but we're having a little bit of communication trouble. So we'll get out there soon. The other place that we have some dishes now, um, just last week, thanks to um, my colleague Matt, is down in Haiti in Lakai, which is the sort of southwest sort of like part that jets out into the ocean there. So Haiti is the poorest country in the Western Hemisphere. It's 97% deforested. People spend more than 25% of their annual income on charcoal, which just leads to the deforestation um, and is very expensive. So it's a huge problem. Haiti, this is, none of this is sustainable for Haiti economics or for their health. But there's obviously because it's the poorest country, there's a lot of poor people, but there's a lot of also internally displaced people living in camps um, without access to any sort of real, real fuel besides charcoal. 
So we're working with this group called LSM, which is a nonprofit organization out of um, Indiana, and then their other staff is in Haiti, and they operate these homes of hope. So each home has an adult couple that lives there, and then up to, I think up to 14 kids live there. And it's not an orphanage. Um, and they're very clear to say it's not an orphanage. You don't age out of this family. Like this becomes your permanent family. Like you will come back to this family as a grown up. These parents like really like take care of it. But each house has two employed cooks to cook for all these people. They, they have six up and running right now. There are another 13 that will be um, opening soon in sort of this large complex that they have down there. Um, and so Matt took down six last week for the six that are up and running and left them with the cooks, trained the cooks how to use them. Now what's interesting about this is that the behavior change isn't as much of an issue because their employer is making them use it. Their, their employer wants to cut the propane costs at the, at the homes, and so the cooks are going to be required to use the sun buckets. But we should still get some really interesting user feedback um, because they'll be using them a lot. And so I'm interested to see what happens, what happens there. Um, so here's just another picture. You can see there's three of the, the homes are right there. That's three of the six homes? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. So my research area on the project is behavior change and then how that leads to adoption, um, which at first maybe sort of seems like a strange thing, being that like here, my, like, my professional life, is about science education, but really this is all just like education, and education really is just how you communicate with whoever you're trying to teach something to, right? So I kind of see it as more or less the same thing, just a different, different setting. Um, so will solar and improved cook stoves have low adoption rates? I wanna find out, is there a way that we can have better adoption rates, or really good adoption rates with our sun buckets? We think through our human-centered design um, philosophy that yes, we could, but... I like humor-centered. I like humor too. I mean, you do have to have some humor when you're doing this. Um, we're trying to like keep behavior changes not to be drastic, and then you know, part of this is is understanding what the motivations are in each community that you go to, and the types of things that drive change and decisions varies. Um, most of the time, it's not health, surprisingly, even though. Um, You'll ask most people in the developing world if they have upper respiratory issues from like inhaling the smoke, they'll say yes, but that alone, improving that health, their health, isn't enough to change a behavior because the convenience of using fire inside the home outweighs that for them. Um, time and money are pretty big um, motivators, as are kids. So, I mean, and then, you know, I'm interested in my kids, right? I was a teacher for 10 years. So, um, we talked about that. So the behaviors that we need to change are, are sort of, I look at it as sort of like three big things. So it's sort of a time behavior change. Um, is it fair to say that charging a sun bucket can replace the time that you're collecting firewood? So for some people who are going out and collecting firewood, um, this in some parts of the world is eight hours of a woman's day, which means that she doesn't have time for paid work and it means her kids don't go to school. If you're in a refugee camp, it also means that you have a very high chance of being raped while you do this. So, I mean, to me, but I'm not in that situation, it seems like charging a sun bucket would save you a lot of time. But is that a motivator? We don't know. The cost. So if you are not collecting free firewood um, or animal waste, you're paying somebody to deliver it for you. Um, and that in some places of the world is more than a quarter of your annual income. Now a sun bucket will pay for itself relatively quickly um, because you're not putting out that monthly fee, but like what is the upfront cost that makes this behavior worth changing for? That's another thing to look at. And then sort of the efficiency and order thing. Like, is it hot, hot enough for you? Like, did you know if you put a lid when you boil water, it's gonna boil faster and then you're gonna have more energy left over? I mean, I never use lids. It kills Matt when he watches me cook, he hates it. I never use a lid. And a lot of people around the world don't use lids. But if you did, you actually get more energy out of the sun bucket and your food's done faster. And then like we talked about when Rebecca asked the question, order matters. Um, is that going to be an issue that you have to boil your water first to make your corn first? It might be. So those are the things I'm looking at, specifically um, how children affect that adoption at home. So I'd like to know if there's parallels that exist between technology uptake um, with cell phone technology and internet technology. I'd like to know that if the kids are exposed to some buckets first at school or in some other setting, if they're interested in it, if that would improve their mother's uptake. Now, that's all nice and easy to say, like, does mom like it? But mom doesn't make the decision in most cultures, the dad does. 
Um, and so then I'm also interested in like, how can we pull the men into this? How can men become stakeholders in what is primarily a female um, role and an issue that impacts the women the most? So that leads me to what forms of communication. A lot of times when people are out in the field trying to get a community interested in a new type of cook stove, whether it's an improved combustion or solar, they'll do cooking demonstrations with community leaders to get people on board, but they do it during the day when all the men are out in the fields or at their jobs or whatever. So the men come home and the wives are all excited about some new product. Well, he doesn't understand what that benefit is. He's not gonna shell out $25 for this new cook stove. He doesn't know what it is. He doesn't know why it's great. He's not the one at the domestic hearth inhaling all the stuff all day long. And so getting the men on board and how to do that is also something that is really important. And it can be done through the right kind of communication. So in order for me to do this type of research, I have some pretty big needs that we're working on, which is why right now I'm kind of just focused on getting money because my, my work is going to be very expensive. I need a lot of sun buckets, which means we need to manufacture them. We did just recently win $100,000 and that will help. Um, and it's also the reason why we have a startup associated with our research group because um, as a research group, no one's going to give us a grant to manufacture and produce things. Unless no one's going to do that. Um, foundations don't want to do that. So even if we were able to like convince like the Clinton Foundation, like we, we want to do this, they might really like the idea, but they don't want to be the person that's paying for them. They'll pay for some sort of distribution model um, or going to these places and working on some part of the social aspect. But manufacturing, no one's going to do that. So you need a business. Um, and so we're working on that at the same time so that the business can provide things for the research that we need. And they kind of go back and forth. Um, I have a partner in Namibia that I'm hoping to work with. Um, Namibia is the least populated country in the world in terms of density. Um, but there's this um, environmental education sort of outpost out in the Kalahari Desert that's run by um, a German American and a South African man. Um, and they only cook with solar there as it is. Um, and so, the, so kids from all over Namibia come here for a week with their teachers and they learn about environmental issues. They, they do science experiments and I don't know exactly all what, all what happens, but all of their cooking and the kids do all of their own cooking while they're there using solar. And so they actually reached out to us. They want one of these. It's like $800 per item to ship there. So we're working on how to get it to Namibia without you know, using all of our money. Um, but I would like to see if at Nadi, the name of the um, environmental center, if kids over a period of time start cooking with the sun buckets, and then if we maybe six months or a year later deploy a bunch to the surrounding communities, um, do the families in which kids who've already been exposed to the sun bucket at Nadi, do those families adopt at a higher or lower rate than other families without kids or without kids who have been there? Um, I need to get to Namibia to learn about what their cultural cooking <coughs> preferences and needs are before we, before we do all this. So this is all a little expensive. Um, oh, it's the same thing, but with a prettier picture. <clears throat> so, um, and then here's the close-up. We started painting them red, um, which I do in my basement with spray paint. Um, but I think they look a lot nicer um, than just cake pans. Um, but yes. The, when it's heated, do you need um, other lids to hold those handles? Or no. are they, yeah, the um, outside stays totally cool. Yeah. So, but that comes with a little bit of a caveat. It has to stay at the focal point of the dish. So if you're going to be out there for an hour, that means you have to go out and maybe adjust it a little bit every 15 minutes or so. If we do an American or North American market, it'd have to have a tracker. No one wants to do that, right? I mean, would you go outside and adjust it every 15 minutes? I would probably forget. If it gets out of focus, the handle might get really hot because now the sun's moved and the focal point is now at the, at the handle. Um, we have, well, not me personally, but one of my colleagues did light her pants on fire by walking in front of a parabolic dish when there was nothing on it and the focal beam got her and lit her pants on fire right away. So it will get hot if something's not at the focal point and has to stay covered. Um, so that's just to say that if it's not focused, some part of it could get hot. Now, if it is in focus, the outside of that stays totally cool. You just take it off with your, with your bare hands. So a tracker, I think, is very, very necessary, particularly if we go after a developed market. Um, and then, you know, maybe, I don't know, maybe tracking can be done a lot cheaper than what it is now. It's not a complicated technology. Maybe there's a way to make it really cheaply so that all of the dishes that we sell would have them. Right now, we're just buying dishes off the shelf. And they're okay. 
You can buy them in bulk for about 20 bucks and from China, directly from China. If you were to buy that on Amazon, it'd be about $100. So we go directly to China, unfortunately, at this point. But there's opportunity there for um, better redesign of the parabolic with a sturdier base, maybe with the tracker. Maybe if we're in charge of that, we can get it all cheaper. So that's sort of a, a down the road thing that we'd like to pursue. This is exciting. Thank you. I got a bunch of questions. Sure, let's hear them. Uh, I spent an incredible amount of my time trying to cook with nothing. Mm -hmm. Living either in the country <clears throat> or the desert or north up in the Arctic areas. What are the surface temperatures at the bottom of the pan in mm -hmm. contact with a fully charged stove? That's a great question. So the surface before you put a pan on it, can reach about 600 degrees Celsius, so it's close to 1,000 degrees Fahrenheit. The second that you put a pan on it, though, um, it starts dropping, right? Because now you, the, the heat's going into the food and you're pulling energy out of the bucket. So it does go down from there. But it is as hot as fire, so it does reach incredibly high temperatures. Now, how, how long, okay, for mm -hmm. example, if I'm gonna put cook chicken on there, mm -hmm. okay, I've got pieces of chicken and everything. I have to get 170 degrees, 180 degrees. Mm -hmm. Does the stove provide enough energy over enough period of time in contact, say, because you're doing it in a cooking pan? <coughs> or, I mean, you could ideally if you use a Dutch oven. Mm -hmm. you, know, you know what I'm talking about? You know what a Dutch mm -hmm. oven is? I do, yeah. Will that cook at a high enough temperature? to get you, whether you're using beef, which is 160, 180 mm -hmm. degrees, where you're in chicken is 180, 190, or 30, mm -hmm. or anything, will you get a, a not high enough sustained temperature to cook that? Because a lot of these meals and everything, you're not going to be boiling in water. Mm -hmm. Okay, so you have to have the high enough <clears throat> temperatures. Yep. So how long does the cook stove last mm -hmm. with a full charge? Is it enough? For, you know, say, for example, a family of four, we're looking at uh, two pounds of beef. Yeah. We're looking at three pounds of chicken. Yeah. So... Can we, do we have enough energy stored in there so that we cook it up to a high enough temperature to get out of the biological half degree? Yes, you do. Um, and I cook like that at home all the time, so I don't boil water every time for corn. Um, sometimes I go straight to searing chicken. Um, the largest quantity of meat I've ever cooked at once is... Searing is not cooking. <coughs> no, but so you sear it because it's hot and then you cook it through. So I've never eaten raw chicken using one of these and I feed my children with it. Um, the largest quantity of meat I've ever cooked at one time is four pounds of chicken. Cooked all the way through. It was able to... It was just falling apart, shredding it to make... What was um, the internal temperature? Of the chicken? I mean, well over 190 degrees or whatever it is for a chicken. Yeah, I mean, it's opaque. There's no pink juices. Completely so how cooked. Long does that take? Um, it depends on your method. It depends on when you're cooking it. So if you were going to start right away, so I used a big Dutch oven and I put it right on the sun bucket and I let it slow cook um, for four hours. Four hours. And I put a lot of barbecue sauce in there and vinegar and brown sugar and just let it go. I make that um, dish my actual slow cooker all the time. You what? I make that dish my actual slow cooker all the time. It's really nice. Yeah. So you can do that. Um, so you're, you're talking about. I mean, what's your average length of chicken? Say if I want to do a chicken dinner, uh -huh. and everything, not boiled chicken. But you, want, you want to fry dinner. it. So what is the duration of cooking sure. three pounds of chicken? Sure. Um, if three pounds of chicken, can you get it all in the pan at once? Yeah. Yeah? Um, 20 minutes. Uh -huh. 20 minutes. Well, that's great. No different than if you're using your gas range or your electric stove at home. Okay. So I recently made um, four very large chicken breasts. I breaded them and then fried them for um, chicken parmesan. And same amount of time if I did it on my on my gas range. You did that on the stove. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Next question. Mm -hmm. uh, obviously, in order to sustain the temperatures that are stored in the phase change material, you have to have an insulation material. Mm -hmm. What does the insulation material consist of? It's a great question. So it is not proprietary to us. It is a off the shelf thing called pyrogel. Um, I'm not sure that I know exactly what all of it is, but it's a very th thick, very dense um, insulation. And it's pink, like the kind that's in your walls, but it's very, very compact. It has a very high R value, so it's um, highly insulated. It's a little on the expensive side, not something that you'd put in your walls at home. Um, but beyond telling you that, what, okay, is there anything the, else you want to talk about? The problem I ran into, and, and I go back, <clears throat> you already have the picture of the wood cooking box. Mm -hmm. 
like I said, Bill Peterson developed that right here. Mm -hmm. The problem we ran into, and, and the concern that I would have on this, and what we ran into with all those other things we ran into with solar collectors, fourth year solar collectors here, is we couldn't get by the outgassing of the material problem. Oh. With the plywood and all the wood, <clears throat> and the plywood, what we had, we had a tremendous outgassing yeah. of formaldehyde, which trans transformed right. into methanol when we had yeah. the water, so we had that toxin went into food. Yep. So the concern, the question I have here on this phase change material, I mean, if you can self-contain and seal it up, obviously it's not a problem. Right. But if not sealed, what is the outgassing properties of the insulation material? And I presume the, the other material is just, what, metal for the, the bucket versus yeah, the whole, plastic? Or what it's, is it's, it? it's all metal. It's metal. Okay. Yeah. Yes, yeah, so that's not a problem. So then you just got the outgassing problems of the insulation material if that's a problem. Mm -hmm. And it, it's not for this for pyrogel. It's not so this particular insulation was chosen precisely for that because it does get so hot. It's in contact with a vessel containing essentially lava. Um, that is a concern for some types of insulation. But um, with this type of insulation, um, there's no out, there's, so there's no, no off gassing. Mm -mm. Okay. Mm -mm. And then I'm going to throw a tremendous outsource for you a place to sell this. Okay. The U.S. military because when we go out to the field, we got to cook. Mm -hmm. And we don't have the capability to transfer everything out. Right. So if we have one or two of these stoves per, per platoon or squad, we can go out there and cook our whole meal mm -hmm. and have a, a solid meal all the time. Mm -hmm. So there you've got a, a tremendous outsource and a place to sell these suckers through Natick and just like holy schmoly. Because yeah. if you've got that capability to cook what you just described from what you're doing, extremely transportable because the sucker is only what? 12 inches across yeah. and what 10 inches high. Mm -hmm. Yep, about eight inches actually. Um, I'm glad that I'm you glad you brought that up. You got an incredible tool. Yeah. So I'm really glad that you said that. Uh, we had been thinking, you know, if we if we went the American market, we were thinking disaster. Like this would be great for FEMA. Um, because that was presented to us. And it was just a week ago, somebody else was like, why aren't you talking to the military? And it takes somebody who has experience in the military to think of that idea, and none of, no one on the team has been in the military, but it's a great, right? have, it's a great idea. In my area, was preventive medicine, okay? What we're doing with the environmental time is all together. So when we go out and cook in the field or we're teaching people how to cook or we're working a disaster, what we call med reps, this is where we're sending out medical teams to solve all these problems <laughs> and teach them how to cook and hygiene and the whole shebang. Mm -hmm. This is the number one big problem. So what I heard when I started, when I first mentioned this thing, I'm looking and go, holy schmoly. Well, this is going to get me better than this because do you have the adequate temperature? Can you cook a full meal in the time available to see if you're out doing the stuff or you're working with people? And when we were working with it um, <laughs> in these rural areas, I mean, we're really backward and then you can work, I do a lot of work up with the Navajos. Mm -hmm. You need to go to Tribal Environmental Council. I've also worked with Jerry Cadella. Okay. He's the honcho for the Four Corners area. But you guys got something here that can solve all kinds of problems. We hope so. It's just exciting as heck. Thank you. I mean, if you have some good contacts of people you think that we should reach out to, yeah. um, by all means, we, I'd love to Again, have it's, it's, just, it's just those the problems is how much, how long does it take to cook? With the different meals that we're cooking, can we get adequate temperatures high enough for a, a duration of time? Mm -hmm. Because one of the problems we ran into, not only with, with the military, and especially in third world nations and backward nations, is they were didn't cook foods at high enough temperatures. <coughs> this is the reason why pork was banned, because uh -huh. pork couldn't be cooked at high enough temperatures before to get rid of the you know the nasties. Right. And that's why that comes on down. So that whole question is can we cook at high enough mm -hmm. temperature when you're putting all this stuff together? And then the other problem we have since we don't have refrigeration, we have meats and everything that are already partially uh, decayed. Okay when you've got it cooked so you can get up to a high enough temperature, then you can overcome that and consume it. Mm -hmm. Are you following me? Yeah, I'm following you. Yeah, yeah I mean, you can this do This is that. exciting. You can do it. Good. I'm glad you're excited. My batteries thingy. For what? For the computer. Oh, did that? You know, that was the last slide. There was nothing, there was nothing else. Okay. I finished right on time, I think, for questions. <laughs> that is terrific. Thank you, Sandy. Thank so, you. you. Yeah. You're not really thinking people are going to carry that hiking, right? I mean, that, you said it's 20 pounds? Yeah, not that, no. So I envision um, if we go American market, 
I envision double wall vacuum, absolutely, because it can't be hot uh, or heavy. And then something much smaller. I mean, if you're if you're camping, yeah, you, don't have to cook a, you don't you don't need to right. you don't need to cook a four course meal, right? right? So you don't need as much energy as what. And are there foldable parabolic dishes? There are foldable yeah. parabolic dishes. In my mind, this is just me sort of dreaming. It'd be very small and slender, about half half the height, so maybe four inches. It would maybe weigh then about five or six pounds. Okay. It's still kind of heavy. How much um, does this thing weigh now? It's twenty-two with the insulation. If we did double wall vacuum, it would be at this size. It would be ten pounds, um, but it's all scalable. Um, I'd like to see a very small collapsible dish with a tractor or, um, I mean, at one point the team, and this predates my time on it, they were talking to the National Park Service. So instead of getting like your firewood when you check in, they hand you a bucket and the dish is already there. Um, in other places of the world where communal cooking is really big, you can have a much bigger dish and it would take an even shorter period of time to charge one. But yeah, for hikers or whatever, it wouldn't need to be much smaller. There are also other thermal uh, storage materials that we could investigate using that might hold slightly higher energies um, so that we could drive the, the volume smaller too. But we haven't been thinking about an American market. Um, I think Matt and um, Bruce Litchfield, who's the PI on the project, were thinking about it like three or four years ago when they first got started. Um, but we're just kind of slowly coming back to that now as a way to have a bigger impact with people How who are. So there's five kilograms so of the material. That. Mm -hmm. okay. mm -hmm. Yeah, it's about five kilograms of that and about five kilograms of insulation. And the, it's just aluminum cake pans on the outside, which are not very heavy. Mm -hmm. How long does it take to charge? I mean, ideal if we don't have a tracking. Mm -hmm. The angle of the dish, the parabolic dish, would be equal to the latitude minus five. Right. Okay, and then it's kind of straight south. But obviously, this changes entirely throughout the year and during the time mm -hmm. of day. If you get a fixed parabolic dish, you know, fixed at latitude minus five, pointing due south, how long does it take to get a full charge in the stove? No, you said you had to change it, right? You it every 15 minutes. Yeah. Well, the sun moves in the parabolic right, you have to keep moving yeah. it. Mm -hmm. We only, the sun doesn't move fast, right? So you only have to go out there in an hour's time, well, and it would take one hour, an hour yeah. 15 minutes, and adjust it three times. Um, the dishes that we use, um, you know, rotate from side to side and up and down to account for um, the sun's <coughs> position at different seasons. So last year on the winter solstice, it took us a little bit longer to charge one, but we charged it out in um, East Urbana. Um, it took a little bit longer than usual because it was the weakest the sun is for us here in Illinois, but we were still able to charge it and, and cook with it on the winter solstice here in Illinois. How long does it take to charge? On the winter solstice, I think it took, it was longer than the hour. Um, two hours? I don't think it was two. It also depends on what, um, so since then we've changed the thermal storage material, so I'm not sure which one that they, we were using back then. But an hour? Go. Yeah. An hour, hour, an hour to two hours at winter solstice in Illinois. So, so then the subscription service, mm -hmm. where, where you know somebody <coughs> came to deliver these, mm -hmm. if I'm right, or if I understood right, uh, it, it starts to lose heat. In fact, overnight, it, it, it's lost a bit, even, even covered. Mm -hmm. uh, you can only boil down water for whatever. Mm -hmm. So if, if you're delivering them, mm -hmm. you want them relatively fully charged. Mm -hmm. So the subscription thing, I'm not going to want to have, you know, the ones charged in the morning, that's not what I want delivered to me. Mm -hmm. Um, how's that subscription thing going to work? So it depends on where it is. So like in places like in Ecuador where there's a mountain separating you from your neighbor, the subscription model is not going to work. But in parts of um, like in Uganda where people live in like, like literally like a circle with their neighbors, um, there could be two ways where a couple are charged in the morning and they're delivered at lunchtime and then other customers get the ones that are charged in the afternoon and then delivered. Um, so if I get one in the morning, I'm not going to have much even to cook that evening. Well, it depends on how well the insulation is improved. How, does, how long is so it? So you can store for six hours and then still cook a full meal. Um, we also think if you, we also think of these each as like one burner on your range. So I think it's completely reasonable that a family of four might have two, and then. So maybe one's delivered in the morning for low heat. 
in one, one yeah, yeah, something like that. Or that they both come at full heat and you use just what you need and then you leave it uncovered and then it's your space heater overnight. What's the temperature so. degradation over time? Um, uh, it depends on the material. Um, you could, we're using two different ones, which I can't tell you because it's uh, just patent so pending. You get a fully, char fully charged stove. Uh -huh. From the time that it's fully charged, what's your time frame before you can start cooking? Zero minutes. You can start immediately. No, I'm not saying you can start immediately, but what's the duration where if it's set idle before you start cooking? Oh, it depends if it's covered or if it's uncovered. If it's covered, it's six hours. If it's uncovered, it depends on a couple of things. It depends on the ambient room temperature and the humidity um, an hour or two to, in order for it to be usable. Um, there is an issue with humidity, which so, we're... So if we, if, if, we, if we build an insulated storage box uh -huh. for carrying, sort of like the igloo, then you're going to keep this all that much longer. Mm -hmm. I mean, have you ever used the, um, the thermoses, like the really good thermos where you can put coffee yeah. in it and three days later it's still hot? It's sort of like, that's sort of the like goal. Mm -hmm. the, the more market the temperature difference between what you're trying to keep warm and the ambient surrounding, the faster you're doing is it? Mm -hmm. And we're dealing with much higher temperatures than what Thermos deals with. Thermos deals with things that are 200 degrees, and we deal with, we're dealing with molten salt. So it's a significant difference. So finding um, a material for the for the seal is important because you can't just put a rubber seal there like thermos can because that's going to go. But I just met someone who... Um, There's a rubber seal in the, in the parts of these things where it puts together or something? No, but you need something at, at the break where a lid would go on, like on a thermos. You need something there for some sort of insulated oh, material. Yeah. Um, but I, I just met somebody who works on the Space Coast in um, Orlando, and he gave me... Um, his friend actually designs heat shields on the, on the rockets. And so I have this guy's contact information, and we're going to talk and see if there's anything just cheap that might, that might help. I was going to ask, is the stuff that is on rockets and the stuff that has direct exposure <laughs> to um, unfiltered UV in space mm -hmm. might be the best materials you have mm -hmm. for? It might also be really expensive yeah. and, yes, and not good. worth it, too. We'll, <laughs> you might have to we'll find out. I, it just sort of seems like if you're involving um, rocket engineers, that things are going to get kind of expensive fast, but you well, don't know. Tea is cheap, so. <laughs> <laughs> this is true. So is vacuum packed ice cream, right? Yeah. I think that was a, right? Was it? I mean, that's what it's an urban legend. Yeah. Right? Right. Right. That's what it's called. It was um, <laughs> some, kind of powder, some kind of powder drink has some kind of relationship with the <laughs> drink. Well, thank you. Thank I you. appreciate it.